Good evening, everybody. Thank you for, for joining this talk. It's great to be here. It's great to contact you and communicate with you in this way. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Western Front, which was published in March, and um, where it came from, what it tries to do. And I'll go through some of the main themes and ideas and arguments that I, that I try and make in the book. And, um, There'll be plenty of time for Q and A later, so um, sit back and enjoy. Um, I had, um, I had, I've written a number of books on the Western Front. It's always been my primary focus of research ever since I've been a historian, um, and so I, I felt I was pretty um, sort of well established, I suppose, and I, I knew that part of the war, I knew that part of history, particularly well. Um, and I had written a book on 100 Days, and then I had written a book on Passchendaele, which came out in 2017 for the centenary. And, uh, you know, I had various ideas about, you know, what I could do next um, that, that, I, that I put to the publisher. And we, we chatted about this, and we chatted about that. There's various, various ideas going back and forth. Um, and nothing really, uh, the publishers, uh, if any of you had dealings with publishers will know, some publishers will like certain type of ideas, others will not like certain types of histories, they'll want different ones. Um, and I thought we could do something, um, there was different ideas were going around. And then I wasn't entirely sure about what I wanted to do. Um, and then it was, it was one of those moments where I, I just sort of, um, I didn't appear in a dream, but it was one of those moments that just came to me very quickly, very naturally. Um, and I thought I, I need to do a, a big book on the whole Western Front. So I've done individual battles. I've done 100 Days, as I said, I've done Passchendaele, I did Lose. Um, I need to do a book on the Western Front because histories of the Western Front are actually quite few and far between. There was uh, John Drain sort of did a semi-history of it. Um, it was an American author, Hunt Tooley did a book on the Western Front. Um, but histories that concentrate solely on this front um, are actually quite few and far between. Richard Holmes did a book. Um, and so I thought, yeah, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a book on the Western Front. Um, and this was communicated to the publisher. I said, look, I, I wanna do a bigger book, um, multiple battles that goes through the whole war on that front. Um, and they liked it, they liked it straight away. So that came back very, very quickly. And, um, and we got started on it. And, you know, I think there were a number of things that I really wanted to do with this book. Um, and I think that reflected my sort of maturing, growing understanding of the war uh, and what I wanted to do. Now, obviously, you know, I had written about the British sector of the Western Front. I'd written about the French and the Americans a little bit in the book on 100 Days. Um, and I knew that predominantly, certainly in, in Britain, we have you know, we know our sector of the Western Front um, and then it all gets a little bit hazy. And so what I wanted to do with this book was to do, of course, a bigger book than I've done in the past, but a book that encompassed the entire Western Front. So I wanted to include the French because I knew that there's been so much fantastic work on the French army in the last 10 or 15 years by numerous historians, Elizabeth Greenhalge, Jonathan Krause, who's done some great work, um, Michelle Goyer, has been at William Philpark, King's College London. There's been so many great studies of the French army that I really wanted to make use of that. Um, and I knew that the story of the French army wasn't really well known outside of, you know, uh, the kind of community that we have on the First World War. Um, and I wanted to bring the Americans in as well. And I wanted to bring the Germans in as well. So I wanted to do a multifaceted history that concentrates on telling the story of all sides on this theater, because this is the decisive theater of the Great War. And I felt um, that this, there was a book in here. And um, there's many challenges of the book, which I'll, which I'll talk about shortly. But, you know, as soon as I started it, I thought this is, this is gonna be something really interesting. And I really enjoyed writing it. It was a great challenge in many ways, but I really enjoyed it. And then as I got into it, I thought, look, I've got to do, I've got to do all of them. So. Um, you know, as I started and really got into the book, I started having conversations about let's do let's do the entire war. So, um, you know, last year we managed to sort of sign everything off. So I'll, I'll complete, you know, I will complete a trilogy on the war. So we're currently writing Eastern Front, 
and then we'll do the wider war in volume three. So it's part of a whole trilogy uh, that aims to tell the whole story of the war from all of this, you know, all perspectives, if you like. So um, it is a great challenge. And this book was a great challenge because fitting everything in without rushing the reader was a big challenge because, you know, as, as everyone I think is well aware, there is such enormous, so, so many battles so much is going on all the time, often at the same time, that writing about it in a way that is not overwhelming for the reader is quite challenging. But I found that the, the way I'd set it out in the fact that I'm concentrating on theatre, so we have the Western Front, um, means that you're not too distracted. I may allude to things which go on in the Eastern Front or Gallipoli or, or whatever, but they're not make the main focus of effort. The main focus of effort is what happens in those four years between 1914 and 1918 in France and Belgium, which is the decisive theater of a great war. The Germans win in the East, but they don't win in the West, which ultimately means they lose the war. Um, so again, the, the challenges I think were really quite significant writing something like this. And again, if any of you have written on uh, any aspect of history, you'll find a number of challenges. So trying to put all of this in, again, in a narrative format so it tells the story without overwhelming or overburdening the reader was quite a challenge. And what I wanted to do primarily was show how war changed and developed over those four years. And again, this is a subject that, you know, Western Front Association, people who've, who know about the war will recognize, but I think perhaps readers who are maybe not so familiar will not know a lot about the French army. They'll perhaps, they'll perhaps know a little bit about Verdun or they might've heard about uh, the Battle of the Marne in 1914, but actually understanding this. And so what you see is a number of themes go through the book. So in the early stages of the book, it's these enormous opening battles of the war. And the French and the Germans are the predominant protagonists here. And the British appear, you know, as an afterthought, really, as a sort of very small force on the flank. And as you go through the book, the British gradually become more and more important as the strength and power of their armed forces increases. Until by about 1916, 17, there's a great parity in the two where the British and French are trying to wage the war uh, side by side. Um, and then, of course, in the final part of the book, the book is split into three parts. In the final part of the book, you see the arrival of the Americans. And I very much wanted to include the Americans in this because I think in some respects, their story is relegated to a, a sort of afterthought in many ways on the Western Front. Um, but they played a crucial role and the British and French would not have won the war had it not been for the Americans. I think that's that's really an important point to stress. And I, I, I think this very strongly as I went through. Um, and so, you know, the, the challenges of condensing everything was, was a real enduring one for me. And I had to add an extra chapter in at the end because I just couldn't fit it in. So it went over the word count, but uh, the publishers were very understanding, thankfully. So uh, we, was, we were able to get it through. Um, but again, there is so much um, that, you know, you have to leave out in a book like this. And some people have criticized me for, oh, I haven't mentioned this battle or I haven't mentioned this battle. Perhaps I haven't, but I, I'd like to think I've mentioned all the most important battles. And so the first part of the book is called War is Not Like Maneuvers. And I found this wonderful quotation from Gerard Lehmann, who was the Belgian commander of Liège, the fortress, which is taken in the very first days of the war when the German Schlieffen plan uh, rolls over Belgium on its way to the classic battle uh, to defeat the French army uh, in six weeks. And uh, he is captured. The Belgian forts are smashed by the German and Austrian super heavy artillery. And he is he's lying there wounded and his German conqueror comes up to him and he sort of offers him his sword. And the, uh, the German commander refuses to take Le Mans sword and says to, to a, you know, to a fort you has been an honor. And Le Mans sort of, uh, sort of jokes, he says, war is not like maneuvers. And that really forms the, the main theme of the first part of the book. And the first part of the book takes place from August 1914, when the 
protagonists begin. We have the great, the battle of the frontiers and the battle of, of the, uh, uh, the sort of fighting in Belgium. And then it goes on through the battle of the Marne. We have the race to the sea where you have this gradual trench deadlock emerge. And then it continues all the way really to the end of 1915. And this first period of the war is very important, as you can imagine, for many, many reasons. First of all, you see a lot of those illusions about peace, about what war is going to be like, get burnt off, and they get burnt off very, very quickly. You also see, and I think this is particularly important, is the French army adapting to the war and adapting to what is going on. And, you know, I think there are a number of of, of characters, important characters in the book, and we'll talk more about them as we go forward. And I really wanted to bring those characters to life. Um, because I think for too often, the generals of the First World War are towards their, their, their black and white figures, they're, they are sort of cardboard cutouts, that they're not real people, they're not flesh and blood. And I very much wanted to bring them to light, to look at their struggles. Um, and a lot of the sort of reviewers of the book have, have made, have, I think, been quite struck by the, the tone of the book. So I focus it very much at the general's level uh, and saying, well, this sort of argues very strongly that the generals were not, you know, the lions and butchers and bunglers or the lions and donkeys and the butchers and bunglers that we have, have become so accustomed to. And, you know, I didn't necessarily want to, want to hit people over the head with that. Um, you know, and I think my views on this have matured and changed over the years that I've looked at it. And I wanted to actually just show, just to try and put ourselves in the position of these commanders and just look at some of the pressures on them, the difficult decisions they had to make. And, you know, I very much wanted the reader to be sitting there and to begin to start to formulate their own assessment of, you know, what would I have done? Do, do I like this guy? Do I not like him? Do I, am I sticking up for him? Am I sticking up for this person? And, um, you know, you can get, you know, for me, I think that's the heart of the war. And I think um, unless we understand the military dynamics and the essential elements of warfare in this period, how war is conducted, I'm not sure we get the war. I'm not sure we were able to understand it. So for me, the war and the, the operational level, the level of generals and, and the way in which battles are directed is the, the fundamental focus of the book. And that's for me, that's the war where it's at. Uh, and I'm not interested in other elements. Other elements are very important and they have their place. But for me, this was a story that I wanted to tell. And I think what you see in the first part of the book is trying to come to terms with the lethality of the war in 1914, the enormous firepower that these armies can bring to bear, the enormous slaughter, and how you, you reconfigure, how you build new armies, how you fight, how you try to work out what you need to do. And, um, how, you know, mistakes are made and mistakes are made throughout the book. And, and you, can, you can see them on all sides. You can see mistakes that are made, or you can at least appreciate why things went wrong and maybe where in many cases there wasn't really an optimal solution there was only ever um, bad solutions or at least less bad solutions and uh, one of my favorite quotations from the war from Charles Mangin um, whatever you do you lose a lot of men um, and he was a man a great experienced commander who knew what the battlefields looked like and uh, frequently written off as a butcher, but he understood what you could and couldn't do. And in many cases, even if you did everything right on the Western Front, you would still lose very, very badly. We still lose a lot of people. Um, and I think that's a truth that is very difficult for us to take. We are used to wars of surgical precision and this was not one of them. So the first part really goes up and it, after those opening battles, it begins to start to illustrate the, the changing nature of warfare, the emerging trench deadlock, and the pressure on the French army, um, on uh, General Joffre, the French commander-in-chief, to try and find a way out. And he is trying to work out what he needs to do 
but at the same time try to bring the British along with him who are kind of their allies that they don't really want to be there and they are looking for ways to try to not be there in many cases. So there's coalition problems as well. And you see the relationships between the commanders um, often are often very fractious. And this is not just in the British and the French or between the British and French, this is in the German army as well. I mean, you have the whole, the early stages of the war, you have the whole rivalry between Falkenheim, who's the chief of the general staff and his main rivals on the Eastern front, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, who naturally want more and more resources to go east to win against Russia. And Falkenheim is trying to balance those two fronts. And the pressure on Falkenheim is equally intense in many ways as it is on Joffre. And both men are impressive, both men make mistakes, both men try their best. And I think it's only now, after a hundred years, that we really are beginning to have a much better assessment of what is going on in this First World War. Um, and things are cooling down, we're able to make more of a, I think a better assessment than we did in the past. And the, the historical work that we've seen over the last 20, 30, 40 years has really contributed to that in many, many ways. So what you see in the first part is you have battles that are fought by the French predominantly to break the trench deadlock. They concentrate firepower, concentrate manpower in certain sectors, um, particularly in Artois and particularly in the Champagne region to try and break through. And they're able to make localized breakthroughs. Um, they're able to seize uh, the heights at Vimy um, on the 9th of May. It's probably the greatest single example of an early breakthrough when Moroccan troops go all the way. Um, but ultimately the grand shattering breakthrough that will restore the wall of maneuver, which is what everyone wants, doesn't happen. And again, the British are tagging along at this stage, trying to learn lessons. And it, and it climaxes in that final great battle um, in, uh, in the September and October of 1915, the British, the British components of the Battle of Luz, the French attack at Artois again, and they attack in Champagne with two reinforced armies. Uh, and again, they're able to make localized gains. But ultimately, uh, as the French president, Renan Poincaré says, there is no getting through. And this is a sort of an end of an era at this point. A lot of the early attempts to do this, to restore movement, to gain a victory have failed. And there is a real reckoning, I think, on all sides at the end of 1915, that the war is gonna go on for far longer than they had anticipated. It's gonna require such a level of force, of manpower, of supplies, of shells that had never been anticipated before the war. So you very much, if you, if you go through the war, and I want to take people through the war in a, in a slow and deliberate manner, you do see a sort of sea change by the end of 1915, where the French have, you know, Joffre's failed and he's taking stock. The British have failed at Luz, or they've, they've made initial gains, but they can't be sustained. So John French, the commander in chief is gone, uh, or will go by the end of the year. And there's that, kind of period of flux, which you see. Um, and again, I'll, I'll come back to this map a few times. You can, again, it's, it's gonna be very familiar to many of you. And this is really where we're talking about, obviously from Verdun all the way up to the uh, Channel Coast. Um, and so you see multiple battles across this area. Um, and I think, again, one of the strengths of the book is that we are, we concentrate on this theater of war. So we're not being diverted to the Eastern Front or um, the Italian Front or whatever it might be. So we're concentrating on these areas. And, um, you know, I think, you know, I very much, I'd written about 1915 before, but actually learning about the French side of it was really, um, really quite profound. And, and as I went through the, the story of the book, um, you know, I did get a great deal of respect for what the French army did in the First World War, which I think is too often obscured, or, or at least sort of, in many cases, ignored. And um, what they are trying to do and the, the kind of tactics and technologies that in many cases they pioneer in 1915 is, is really rather impressive. The, the stuff they're doing with infantry infiltration tactics, um, 
the things they're doing, they're even experimenting with poison gas as a counter battery weapon. So they're firing poison gas at German guns. They are using um, creeping barrages, things like that we don't tend to associate with this early in the war. They're doing all kinds of interesting things. So it, it shows a degree of, of sort of intelligence and application, which again, we don't necessarily always associate with this period. And in many cases, these things don't work. But I think that still doesn't detract from the enormous strides they are making in what is a very difficult situation. The Western Front is not easy to fight in. And again, as I said before, even when you try your best and you do everything right, you don't always, you're not always guaranteed victory. And that's a, that's a difficult lesson to learn. Um, the, the, the pictures on screen will be obviously familiar to many of you. And these are the main you know, protagonists in the first part of the book. Obviously, on the top left, we have uh, von Malta, uh, who sort of appears really at the beginning of the book. And of course, uh, I think by the end of the second chapter, he's had a nervous breakdown and is, is re eventually replaced by the chap below him, uh, Eric von Falkenheim. There's not many photos of Falkenheim. But I like this photo I found. He looks quite menacing, and I'm not necessarily sure that is him. But there is a sort of solidity to Falkenheim, a kind of um, coldness, I suppose, which uh, Malta doesn't have. Malta is a warmer individual, but he's also more fragile in many respects. He's more emotional. And on the Western Front, that's terribly good. The same issue with Sir John French uh, on, the, on the top right. Um, Again, a man who was not really made for the First World War. He's a man of a, an earlier era, more of an, you know, he, the South African War for John French was his war in many ways. It was a war that had maneuver, riding across the veldt. It was a war of scale. It, it was a war that he was attuned to and he could make a great um, impact on. First World War, he, he's out of his depth, as, as many of us would be. Um, and by the end of 1915, he's really had enough and he's not able to perform effectively. And in the center there, you have Ferdinand Foch, you have Philippe Pétain, you have General Joff in the bottom right. And these are characters which you see throughout all phases of the book. They play a crucial role. And there's no doubt that they make mistakes, but I think certainly for Joffre, he's, he is a great hero, certainly the early stages of the war and his stolidity and his strength at the Marne really ensured that the French did not lose. And the, fa the fact that they failed to win in 1915, 1916, I'm not really sure can be blamed on him, given the context and the limitations that he was operating under. So, Again, the sea change that I talked about at the end of 1915, you very much feel it because we have a new British commander in chief that comes in in December of 1915, Sir Douglas Haig, again, very well known to all of us. Um, and you have the, the scales of fate was from a, a quotation from Poincaré, the French president in, uh, in August of 1916, when he talks about these great battles that are going on, Somme and Verdun, which will define 1916. And he talks about scales of fate are now shifting in our favor and we're finally winning and it's an interesting one and I, I very much thought it fitted with this stage so the second part of the book takes us from december of 1915 when the allies are having to really work out what they're going to do how, how they how they're going to win this war and it goes all the way to the spring of 1917 now this is the if you like the epitome of trench warfare that we all know um, those twin battles of Verdun on the Somme have enshrined the kind of horrors of trench warfare. At this point, we have steel helmets, of course. We have these, these sort of troglodyte existence in the trenches. We have enormous advances in artillery, um, firepower. Um, we have tanks come in. We have the real growth of air power in 1916. So you see the war becoming much more technical um, and complex and again, becoming much more of a sort of three-dimensional battle than perhaps it was in the earlier uh, year. And, you know, 
you see it begins with the German attack on Verdun, which is, if you like, a modern battle with its, its design of attrition. The Germans are, dis- are fighting to kill Frenchmen and to disable them in that, re- in that way. And then you see the British gradually becoming more and more powerful. And of course, they then take their place as a mass army on the Western Front on the 1st of July, 1916, the first day of the Somme. So again, in, in this part, we see, as well as that technical and tactical shifts that, that go through, you do see the continuing difficulties between the British and the French. Haig and Joffre, they get on okay, I suppose, but um, Joffre prefers Haig to his predecessor, Sir John French finds Haig good to work with. Um, Haig is never that impressed with Joffre. He thinks he calls him an old man. And there's a sense that he's yesterday's man. And so the two, um, they work together reasonably effectively, but certainly as we see on the Somme, the British and French always struggle to coordinate the grand joint attack that would probably be the best thing they could do. Um, And you begin to see a sort of, you know, those commanders, when I talk about quite a lot in the book, those commanders that still revere the kind of breakthrough, the idea that the the whole point of operations is to break through and and maneuver. And you see those commanders, sort of like Philippe Pétain in the French army, who's risen to army command at this point, uh, who take the lesson of the the battles in Champagne in 1915, that essentially breakthrough is never going to happen. So you need to fight in a different, more limited, attritional way. And so you do see these two different philosophies of war sort of rub up against each other through the year as different commanders have different approaches to the challenges of trench warfare. You see this with Rawlinson and Haig on the Somme, and you see this with someone like Pétain, and you see it with Joffre, who's more of an old-fashioned, prefers the breakthrough rather than Pétain, who is more... Yeah, often called a pessimist or, or someone who I would argue is more realistic about what you can achieve given the strength and the ever-growing depth and complexity of the defenses that the Allies face um, and that Germany continually adds to as each battle goes on. So this is really the, the hinge and the center point of the book of these battles and it carries on And as the Somme and Verdun sort of sputter to an inconclusive end in November and December 1916, you do see not necessarily a sea change, but a growing desperation in the French army that um, whatever they're doing just isn't working. Now, clearly they're, they're getting, they're becoming quite effective on what they can do on the battlefield. They've got a lot more artillery now than they have in 1914. Um, but they're running out of manpower and they're running out of patience and they, they, they are getting increasingly desperate. Um, whereas the British end the Somme, again, disappointed that the, the aims had not been achieved, but there's a sense with the British there still is more to come from them. Um, and so you get, and again, the book details these um, negotiations, if you will. Obviously, we've got Haig here, we've got Pétain. We've got the chap in the center, General Robert Nivelle, and he becomes one of the crucial characters of the second phase of the second part of the book. Now, Nivelle is someone I hadn't really, I didn't really know a lot about Nivelle, uh, but he's a fascinating character. Uh, he becomes the Joffre's replacement because patience with Joffre is running out by the end of 1916, and the French government, um, obviously grateful for his service, but they want him out of the way. So kick him upstairs into a very high sounding position which ultimately has no operational control of the forces and they hand it all to General Robert Nivelle who had the previous year had been a corps commander and then an army commander and he gains a reputation as being a coming man uh, a great artillery commander and who understands the modern battlefield and can utilize things like the creeping barrage very effectively and I uh, you know Nivelle, you know, they choose Nivelle because they just, they, they say he's got the formula. He's, he's got, he's lucky. He's a lucky general. And um, Nivelle, of course, is the author of the Nivelle Offensive of the spring of 1917, which ultimately cripples the French army. 
and brings about what I call the darkest hour of the Allied forces, uh, where France is essentially hit, the, it's hit, it's just sort of crashed. It can't carry on really. So Nivelle wants to do what he's done at Verdun on a quite small scale, on a much bigger scale. And, and you know, Nivelle is not suited to it and he's found out quite quickly. He's a good battlefield commander, but when he is promoted to this strategic position, he, he really struggles and ultimately he's not able to replicate what he had done at Verdun when he masterminds the recapture of the famed Fort Douaumont. And as I went through, I really felt for Nouvelle because I think he is someone who, um, when he's, he's, they try the offensive and it doesn't work and they fail and he's sacked in May 1917. And he tells Poincaré, he says, look, you know, I am a soldier. You know, and I've thought about only two things these past three or two and a half, three years, France and the enemy. Um, and ultimately, he is someone who is found out by the war and he's sent away to North Africa. And we, we don't know a lot more about him. But Novell is a very fascinating character because he, his star rises very, very quickly and then it fizzles out almost equally as quickly. And of course, then the French army have to go back to Pétain, who had been very not dismissive, but very cautious about Nivelle's grand plans for a breakthrough in 1917, and they go back to him. And Pétain then takes charge of the French army for the rest of the war. And again, you see someone like Pétain, his star continues to rise and events continue to prove him correct in his assessment about what the French can do and what they can't do. But you still see these twin sort of poles of, of breakthrough and attrition, um, again, rubbing up against one another, kind of clashing, two different philosophies of warfare, and they're both here. And the different generals all have their own assessments of it. So, of course, we have Hindenburg and Ludendorff, which come in in the late August of 1916, replacing Falkenhayn. And, you know, again, these characters can be quite difficult to gauge, but you know, the relationship between those two men as they uh, try to work out a way of winning the war is very, very important. Both have strengths, both have weaknesses. And ultimately, as the Allies are struggling with how to fight this war and to harness the manpower and the industrial power that they have, at the same time, Hinterberg and Ludendorff are trying to work out how they can defend and ultimately how they can win the war. And so you see not the same debates with the German army, but similar arguments about can you win, where do you win? Um, and they had long wanted to win in the East. Uh, and then when they come to the West, it's really telling when they come to the West, Alpha Falkenheim is deposed, they are horrified and completely shocked at what they see because they had spent the, the last two years in, uh, in Poland, in Galicia and beating the Russians. Um, and of course had continually pestered Falkenheim for more and more divisions. They could, their appetite could never be sated. And they'd always seen Falkenheim as a sort of miser, selfish, um, who, who had completely underestimated the, the possibilities in the East. Falkenheim's perspective is he can't lose on the West. They can't lose in the West, so they have to make sure that line holds. And he will give Hindenburg and Lunov what he can, but he can't give them everything he wants because he has to keep the West strong, or at least strong enough. And when Hindenburg and Ludendorff come in, they see, actually, Falkenheim was right. We can't withdraw any divisions from the West because the, the, the Entente are, so, are becoming so powerful and the artillery and the tanks are becoming extremely difficult for our divisions to deal with. So it's fascinating seeing these arguments and the pressures on these characters just continue to rise as the blood cost continues to increase. So we now go to the final part of the book and this uh, begins in, in the June of 1917 where Nivelle has been sacked. The French army have gone into mutiny, or at least at least a third of it goes into some form of um, what the French official history calls collective acts of indiscipline. 
And, you know, the arrival of the Americans is so crucial because the, without the American entry, um, it's very difficult for the allies to contemplate facing another year or another year or two of conflict, given that the, the largest army on the Western Front, the French, is, is essentially in a period of remission where it, it can't really do a lot. It can hold the line, but it's not going to be able to make the, the grand play. It's not going to be able to make the big offensives that, um, that it will clearly be required. Um, and so again, in part three, I think there are a number of themes. First of all, you don't get the Allies still are not fighting as a single alliance. So Haig had, had sort of suffered under Nouvelle. He didn't rate Nouvelle. He didn't think Nouvelle was particularly important or, or, or a correct general had been strong armed into it by the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. So as soon as Nouvelle is gone, Haig says, right, I am going to attack in Flanders. That's where we need to win. So Pétain doesn't believe you're going to win in Flanders. So He's, he's not interested in this. So the British and French commanders, Haig and Petain, they never get on too well. And Haig feels that, well, I've done my bit for Nouvelle. I've made a subsidiary attack at Arras, so I'm gonna do my own thing. And so the allies are fighting separate wars. And I think this is a major problem. Um, and so you go through this period of 1917, uh, major, major battles. Again, those themes of, of sort of transformation and change are all there. Uh, through 30, through um, Cambrai with the tanks and predicted artillery fire. But you also see the growth of the American entry, which starts quite slowly, but of course then becomes uh, effective by 1918. And of course, it comes full circle for the final year of the war, 1918. Um, and I think, you know, 1918 is such a fascinating year, and it's a, a year that Again, I think we still don't give enough attention to in terms of what is actually going on here. Um, the Germans are by this point, as we know, they have won in the East. They have, well, Russia has gone into revolution in November, or you have a February revolution, then you have a November revolution. And you have a, the punitive peace of Brest of Tovsk, which is signed in March. So Russia's out of the war and Germany have won a vast new empire in the East. They have won. And Hindenburg and Ludendorff make the decision, there's no civilians at present, uh, which tells you something about German governance. Um, they make the decision that the disintegration of Russia means that they can bring troops back, about a million uh, troops, and they can make a final effort in the West. They make this decision for a number of reasons, predominantly because they are, they can only see an end to the war through total victory. It's with Ludendorff, it's zero or one. You either totally lose or you win. And so they win and they have won in the East. Therefore they will now win in the West. But the decision is also taken because of the specter of American entry. The fact that the Americans are, they're not there in particularly large numbers at the turn of the year into 1918, there's only about 250,000 Americans. But they are growing in strength and they are going to become bigger. They're going to become stronger. And so therefore, if the Germans are going to win on the Western Front, there is a strict time limit to that. Because once you get to the summer of 1918, it's undoubtedly true that the Americans are going to be there in big numbers uh, based on the current estimates they have for the build-up. And so it is a once in a lifetime opportunity for the Germans to win. And of course, Ludendorff is a gambler. He's an aggressive commander. He wants to win on the battlefield. And so that's what he tries to do. And the story of, you know, what subsequently happens, which becomes the sort of climactic moments of the book is this, this matter of command, which is the big theme in the final book. What are the allies gonna do? Can they get the command issues, which they've had sorted and can they withstand the attack and then can they counter attack? Um, and so you get many of the characters we've already seen, Foch of course becoming Generalissimo in March of 1918 when the allies, the British and French are on the spectre of defeat and separation. Ludendorff with his pickle harbor, 
Abe, of course, in the center, plays a key role in 1918. And we have Pershing on the left, the American commander in chief. And of course, he adds a, a different dimension to the allies uh, who have now a Supreme War Council. So you can see the allies are finally, finally beginning to get their act together for a number of reasons, but finally they're beginning to pool resources. And again, as you go through the book, so many arguments, so many ill tempers, but the allies are becoming much more effective at establishing the bedrock of a coalition that will be able to fight in a seamless way should the war carry on beyond 1919 or beyond 1918. And so the story of 1918 is a story of battles. The battles continue um, as the Americans are built up, the Americans are there by the summer, and then they're able to take it onto the war and onto the German army in the autumn, in those final weeks. Um, but it's really only from August of 1918 that the, that the, the American army, the first American army is in. So the Americans are vital but their actual major battlefield role doesn't really happen until that sort of late summer period. But as we go through the book, um, they're able to do it. And at the end of the day, you have those, those key individuals in the Allied side, you have people like French, you have people like Joffre, Petain and Foch, Pershing. These become what I call like a remarkable fellowship of, of men, but they don't always see eye to eye. They do sometimes, really don't get on. Petan and, and Hager are two ill-suited individuals. Foch becomes so important because of his character, because his charisma, and the fact that everyone likes Foch. Um, Pershing is a man that I think the Allies learn to respect. He's a man that holds and plays the American card very strongly. He wants an American army, and he will get it. And of course, Haig, who is, again, takes a much more sort of a, not a backseat role, but a much more relaxed role in 1918 and proves, I think, more effective than he's ever been. So that final period, that final matter of command of the Allies actually have a single commander in Foch, really, I think, brings the war to us, again, a full circle and a final, um, quite satisfying conclusion, I hope. So, you know, these were the main themes that I wanted to bring out in the book. And you know, I think once you see it as a whole, I think a new story emerges that maybe, you know, I'd only really appreciated in part. And I think most people, when they write about the first of all, tend to write histories of battles or histories of units or histories of individuals, maybe. Um, and all those are sort of partial snapshots of what is going on. And so Hopefully, if you read the book, you'll take you through the whole history of the Western Front and you'll be able to appreciate where we start from and where we get to at the end. And only by doing that can you then make a judgment on those issues that we always love to talk about, lions and donkeys, commanders, leadership in war. And so, again, I sort of leave it up to the readers, really, to, to read it with an open mind, sit beside the generals, and ultimately make up your own mind as to you know, what they did and perhaps what you would have done had you been in that situation. Um, but uh, there we go. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. And um, I think we've got plenty of time for questions. Nick, thanks very much indeed. That was tremendous. A really excellent overview of, of, of the entire Western Front. Ladies and gentlemen, if I'd like to, if, if I can invite anybody, uh, th those watching, uh, to, to raise their hands as a, as a sign of, as a silent, uh, but nevertheless heartfelt uh, sign, uh, round, uh, thanks Nick, I can confirm that there's hundreds of hands going up as a silent uh, round of applause there for you, so th thanks very much for that. Um, it's Q&A time everybody, so just to, we can, if you can want to tap in the questions into the Q&A box, that would be uh, tremendous. Uh, we've got a couple of early questions. Um, one's from Terry. T Terry's asked this. Um, von Valken Falkenheim was replaced, obviously, by uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff. Do you think that, um, that if he had not been replaced, the war may have turned out differently, i.e. were uh, um, Hindenburg and Ludendorff as good as um, uh, managing the war as has been suggested? That, that's the first question we've got. That's a really good question, actually. And I think this was something I 
kind of toyed with really. Um, and I think Falkenheim is a big mistake, I suppose, is Verdun. Before Verdun, if you look at what he takes over in 1914, and 1915 is extremely successful for um, for the German army. They, they absolutely, not, they don't destroy, but they wreck large parts of the Russian army. They take Poland, Galicia, they bail the Austrians out, they conquer Serbia. They do, they essentially win in the East in 1915, or at least they cripple the Russians. And they've held off on the West. And so by the end of 1915, Falkenheim is a very good position. But then he decides to go, and his reasoning for Verdun is quite strange because he, he, he believes that the British are the prime enemy, but the French are the British, so, the sword in the British hands. So therefore he's going to defeat the French army. So it's quite strange reasoning. And from Verdun onwards, he seems to make a few errors. But having said that, I do think Falkenheim always had a more realistic assessment of the reality of the war, the fact that this was going to take a long time, this was going to require very careful management, you're going to need to have political, some political agreement, um, than his successors, Hindenburg Ludendorff, who, who was kind of go for broke, all or nothing in a sort of total war. And... Um, Ultimately, they bring Germany to ruin because they don't see any reason or need for political concessions or any kind of assessment about how powerful their enemy has become, which Falkenheim knew. So I think Falkenheim was more level headed and Germany would have been better to keep him, whereas Hindenburg and Ludendorff are, are much more aggressive and ultimately bring Germany to ruin. So, you know, again, counterfactuals are very different, but I think that. Falkenheim just had a, a more realistic assessment of just how big the war was and how it was unlikely we we're going to get that massive, decisive, grand battle and win um, in in a in a matter of days. So yeah, that's a really interesting question. Thanks for thanks for that, Nick. Thanks for your question as well, um, to Terry. Yes, yeah, thanks for that, uh, Peter. Um, you, you're uh, live and your uh, microphone's unmuted, so do you know? Fire away with your question. Uh, thank you, uh, David. Um, excellent. Nick, enjoyed that a lot. Um, can I say before I ask my question, I, I don't mean um, to question your, your, your central tenet, but um, I think playing counterfactuals is sometimes quite fun. So um, you stated that the Western Front was the decisive theatre of the war. I'm not saying, again, as I said, I'm not disagreeing with you necessarily, but be interested to know where you would place the successful U-boat suppression and uh, blockade of the Central Powers. I mean, if the Allies had not won in these theatres, could they have won on land? Yeah, I mean, I tend to see that as a kind of um, sort of subsidiary front to the Western Front in a way. I think it's, it's obviously, it's all related in a sense, but I think if you're talking about the main theatre of operation and, you know, I would think, you know, the Eastern Front, the Western Front, Mediterranean, I think the Western Front and that great clash of arms is where the, the decision is ultimately made. Now, clearly the, the U-boat campaign and the, the blockade have an effect in weakening Germany, weakening the central powers, pressuring them in all kinds of ways. Um, but ultimately that has to have its effect on the army in the field. And, um, until the army in the field is defeated or at least gets to you know falling apart then um you're not going to win the war so the western front is still i think the decisive theater of the war that's where the the battle is you know that's where it's won and lost and ultimately that's where germany have to win if they're going to win or at least you know not lose okay th thanks thanks for that nick um we've got a question from from becca Bernstein, which is very similar to Sarah Helen's question. So um, combining the two questions here, um, Becca hasn't got a, a video, so I'll, I'll read out Becca's question. If possible, please ask this question for me. Given your past research and extensive expertise, was there anything surprising you discovered whilst researching this book? And Sarah asks a similar question. When researching your work, is there any point that you looked at completely differently from what you thought of before? So two very similar questions there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I don't think being things necessarily surprised me. I think I was, you know, my, my, I think I said at the beginning, my 
admiration for the French army increased um, as I went through the book. And I think that that really has to be appreciated. Um, I think there were individuals that I liked, that I grew to like as the, as, you know, as the book went on. There were individuals I, I didn't like, but I think there's some characters, like I really like, I really like writing about Nivelle because ultimately he's a tragic character, he fails, but I kind of felt sympathy for him. I felt sorry for him. And I, I felt he, he would have, you know, in, in another war, he would have been really, really good. And, you know, other people that I really liked. Um, so I don't think it was necessarily a surprise. I think it was just sort of, just seeing how it emerged. And, um, you know, I mean, Falkenheim was someone I grew to admire as the, as the book went on. And I think that admiration continued after he's gone, as, as we talked about just, just previously. I think you, you begin to see that comparison between the, because you can't, you can't help but play top trumps, you know, your favorite generals and that kind of thing. So that was always really, really fun. Um, but yeah, I think there were some elements, I think different battles, I think surprised me in terms of just some of the technologies that I wasn't aware of. Um, but I think it was just the whole thing, seeing it come together, really. Thanks, Nick. Um, Lin Linda's question, I I'm gonna invite Linda to unmute. Uh, that more or less touched very much on your question, Linda. So rightly or wrongly, I'm gonna pull your question up, up now because that because Nick's just more or less touched on it. Go on, Linda, ask your question. Yeah, yes, thank you. I mean, I, I thought the multifaceted approach is really interesting and, and maybe not very common. And so I wondered if you'd been there, which general would you have liked to have worked for in any nationality, any time of the war? Who did you admire the most? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about that one, actually. Um, I would have liked to work with Philip Pétain because um, I just think he, uh, well, he's one of the number of I would have liked to work with because I think he, he seemed to have a really good assessment early on about what they could do, what they couldn't do. And I think he was a really interesting individual. Um, you know, the, I would have liked to, you know, there's British generals I would have liked to have worked with as well. I would have liked to work with Herbert Plumer or oh, Sir Arthur Curry. I think they were great. I think they would have been good to get on with. I think they were relatively easy going as well. Um, you know, on the contrary, you know, working for someone like Ludendorff would have been an absolute nightmare. They'd have been totally micro, they'd have been micromanaging you, phoning you at all hours of the day, demanding that you move divisions around. They'd have been an absolute nightmare. Charles Mangin, the, the French commander, would have been terrible to work with because he got you killed very easily <laughs> so, for probably all the right reasons. But, you know, yeah. so, um, yeah, there, there were, it was probably probably those more cautious generals I'd have been eager to work with rather than the more sort of aggressive ones than uh, that comes out. But again, there was some that would have, there were great generals, but would have been terrible to work for. General von Klott who commanded the first army in um, August, 1914, the first German army. He had a habit of just carrying firearms around with him. Like you don't often see generals in the first war with firearms, but Cluck would fire, and he means like rifles. He'd carry rifles with him on his personal. So he'd just be walking around French Chateau with a rifle. And there's a sense of Cluck of just being sort of suppressed energy. You know, again, someone you don't necessarily want to be around, but again, makes really good soldier. So again, usually the best soldiers are those people uh, that, that's not necessarily easy to get on with. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Linda, for your question. Kieran, um, you're next up. You're known to mute yourself there. Yeah, hi, uh, uh, good evening. Um, I was just thinking about the spring offensive in 1918 uh, and the failure of the Germans and how uh, there's always this uh, argument whether it was the failure of Ludendorff and his tactics or the resolute fighting of the BEF and its allies. And where do you stand on that? Well, I mean, clearly it's a bit of both, I think. Um... <clears throat> The Allies are able to hold on in 1918 and they're able to do a lot of damage to, to the, the Germans. Ultimately, they lose ground, which is not that vital. Um, having said that, you know, they, they take a lot of casualties for that. So the French take casualties as well. So it's a terrible, terrible battle. I mean, I think I, my view is that the March offensive is, is just ill-designed and should not have happened, really. I mean, the thing they should have done is... is is build more defensive lines in the West. And, you know, it, it, you're in a position, you win in the East, you bring all those reinforcements forward and you dig in, and then you make concrete peace proposals to give up Belgium or, or you, you know, you, you try and separate the allies like that. You talk very, you, you have peace conferences, you send politicians, you talk about, you know, giving Belgium 
some level of independence and you talk, you waffle about Alsace, you can make these kind of, you can throw sand in the Allies' eyes and make it much more difficult for them to, to attack, or at least you let the Allies say, well, attack us. So that would have been the best option for Germany in 1918, I think, because you, you I'm not saying it doesn't have difficulties politically selling this back home. I'm not suggesting it's easy, but I think it's easier. And you then you go back to 1914 borders in, in, in the West and you win in the East. And, and or you win the Balkans and you essentially control Russia. So you, you win the vast hinterland of, of Europe. But so I think I think Michael is just asking too much of the German army at this point of the war. It's just it's such a big ask. They're able to, you know, they make great gains initially, but but it's just not enough in a sense. So, so yeah, I mean, I've had this argument uh, many, many times. I personally, I probably also would have attacked the British. I would have, I mean, he attacks the British at the very low, you know, the very southern point. I would have attacked the British more in a more northerly way. I was, I, because it's much more difficult for the French to provide reserves then. And if you can knock Britain out of the war, then that's, it's probably easier to do than knocking the French out. But then again, I'm just speculating. But my view, I think predominantly, I think you're right. I think it's both. But I think the, the March offensive is difficult to achieve. You can war game it, but it's, it's very hard to see Germany winning, I think, because they've only got so much time. They've got to do it quickly. And if they don't do it quickly, it's game over. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for your question there, Kieran. Um, John Casey. John, you're next up. You want to unmute yourself? Yep, thanks very much, Nick. Um, to what extent do you go in the book into the degree of control and influence that French and British politicians had over the strategy and operations on the Western Front? Yeah, it's definitely in there, and you you know you have a, um, certainly in the first part of the book you see the uh, the sort of re-establishment of or the, the growth of French political control because obviously Joffre in 1914 is is almost like a dictator really is I mean, he's got all this power and then as it doesn't work or as, as the front sort of solidifies you see these politicians gradually become more and more arrayed and they start to to gradually claw power back from Joffre ultimately resulting. At the end of 1916 in his, let's call this promotion. Um, and again, at the same time, it's slightly different in Britain because you've always had quite a strong political element with, uh, with Asquith's government, with Lord Kitchener, with um, and, you know, David Lloyd George. So it's slightly different, but you do see those debates. And of course, you've got you know, the February conference with Lloyd George and, and the, the, you know, the, the absolute mess that is Britain's civil military relations in the war and the relations between Lord George and Hague. So it's very much part of the process of, of trying to, you know, those, those arguments about how and why and, you know, where you should fight the war. So all that's definitely part of it. And I think particularly with the French, it's interesting because you see those French deputies just becoming more and more powerful as they try to, you know, they've essentially given Joffre all this power and and then they're actually worrying, well, we can't let this carry on because it's not, you know, it's not working. So you see that real stress and strain within the French political sort of domestic sphere um, becomes very, very strong. And ultimately is, is really crucial in some of those key appointments later on in the war. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for that. Ted, um, you know, are oh, you on mute today? Uh, fire away, Ted, with your question. Uh, thank you, Nick. It is a really interesting perspective that. Um, I'm just um, interested why um, Fock was able to jump Pétain to become commander in chief. I was wondering how much the animosity between Haig and Pétain played a part in that. Yeah, there's, there's definitely that factor. Um, Pétain doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. Um, he is there in the meetings at Doulon where they're all there and um, Pétain talks to, you know, Clemenceau and says, you know, he's 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 very depressed. He's there. He's 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 very low. He's quite a low energy character. And and you could argue with Petan that 1918 kind of catches him out a bit. Uh, he's 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 not really the right man. But as much as I like him, I think he he, he just doesn't really see victory in that sense. But anyway, he says um, the Germans will defeat the British and then uh, they will beat us. And that's how it's going to play out. And Clemenceau is 
he sort of looks at him and says, well, should a general, you know, he says to his aide, should a general speak like this? So Petain kind of takes himself out of the running, if there was any, but because they just don't think he's, he just, you know, he's there very resigned. They will defeat you because the, the British are hopeless and then they'll defeat us. And that's it. It's 1940, um, sort of a, a premonition of 1940 in a way. Um, and so Fo Foch is, you know, Pétain is commander in chief of the French army. He's not moving anywhere. The British would not trust Pétain in that way. They hate, particularly like him. You know, so it's sort of, it's, it's Foch selects himself in a way because he's the only, you know, who else would it have been? You could argue some of the French army group commanders, which again, largely unknown to, to us today. Um, but none of them have really worked with the British in the way that Foch has. So they're really the, you know, you, you kind of, he's the inevitable candidate really. Um, and he's, he still has the fire. He still has the sort of the energy and determination to do it. So he's not a controversial choice in that sense. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Ian. A wonderful talk and thank you so much. Um, so I've always, I've always viewed Pershing as sort of a Melchett character, both because of my my way or the highway mentality and because he was purely a political appointment among the available generals. I, I was wondering how you'd rate him next to Patain or Ludendorff or Egg. Yeah, no, I think I mean, per Pershing is quite a difficult character to gauge because he's sort of, he's so upstanding and up straight and you, you can't really get behind the mask in a way, the mask of command. Um, I think it should be, you shouldn't underestimate the pressure he faces when he gets to France. Everyone wants him and everyone wants the Americans. So they're constantly bombarding him. What are you going to do? When are you going to do this? How many Americans have you got? We need these divisions now. So there's constant pressure from the British and the French. And Pershing has to take all of that. And I think ultimately his decision that the Americans need to fight under an American flag is, is the correct, inevitable decision. There's no way the French, the, the the Americans are going to give their sons to fight under the French and the British on any large scale. I mean, they do it for the odd division here and there, but not as a, you know, not as a permanent thing. So he has to do it. And there's one, there's one time where, you know, Foch, you have these arguments, Foch says to Petain, he says, you are willing to, to let the Allies be pushed back to the Loire? And he says, yeah, fine. And there's another one where Lloyd George has a right go at him in one of the conferences. He says, well, this is just before the... Um, I think this is this sort of just before the spring offensive where they know something's coming. Lord George says to Pershing, he's because they're trying to get the Americans to agree to essentially just send manpower over, not form divisions, just just infantry without supporting elements. And uh, and he, Pershing doesn't want this. He wants full, fully formed divisions, which is perfectly understandable. And uh, Lord George says to him, he says, you know, if the British and French go under, well, we can say we did it honourably because we've given everything. Whereas the Americans haven't even put in as many men as Belgium has. And the Persian doesn't even flinch. <laughs> so it's, it's, you could see the tension is so, so I shouldn't underestimate that. I think Pershing finds it difficult in a sense that he wants to fight in more of an open war, more of a maneuverist war. And what I think is interesting is, is he's more classical. He's like Haig in that sense. He, he sees war, the rifleman being the predominant actor on the battlefield. And it's interesting if you look at the, the sort of the dichotomy between him and his sort of more subordinate commanders who get trained up by the British and French. They go to the front much more, they, they see operations and they immediately appreciate. If you look at the number of the corps commanders and the and divisional commanders in the American Expeditionary Force, they immediately see actually this is not like we're not in Kansas anymore, you know, this, this is sort of the amount of artillery and firepower and complex battle plans we need to take one trench line is so far above our heads that we need to use all this heavy stuff. We need air power. We need all the French, all that they can give us. And so all those Americans at the subordinate level have a much more realistic assessment of actual what battles actually like. Whereas Pershing, and then Pershing gets these reports which come up. We need all this artillery. We can't go, we can only go so far. And Pershing is like, well, this is not, so he's constantly suspicious of the French for getting into sort of trench habits. Um, 
and there are pros and cons to that because ultimately he is able to to keep the American army going and to you know to make sure they have that attitude of, of breaking through and you've got the whole Sam Mihal Merzogon argument should they have continued at some and not moved to the Merzogon um, and I to a certain degree I used to sympathize with Pershing's position so I think Pershing does not disgrace himself on the Western Front. Um, he's faced with many difficulties, but he doesn't necessarily do that much wrong, I think, would be my assessment of him. But it's difficult for him to really prove himself in the, the full sense of the term. Um, I think if Pershing had been on the Western Front earlier, you would have been a very different story, but, you know. Thank you. Th thanks for your question, Ian. Thanks. Um, Andrew. Andrew Willison. Andrew, do you want to unmute yourself there? wanted to ask, uh, were the French mutinies, um, did you think they had any significant effect or is it just something that we, the Brits, like to, uh, to overplay and uh, sort of you knock know, the French as we normally do? I think, you know, ultimately then they don't, you know, they, they don't succeed in overthrowing the army or anything like that. But I think they're, they're really important because they illustrate um, just how tired the French are becoming. Having said that, the British, at least throughout most of 1917, aren't that clued into it. So they're not that sure what's going on. They get rumours that something's not right in the French army. They kind of know that there's been Nivelle has been sacked and there's issues with that. So they know something's going on. But they don't really know how many divisions have been affected. Um, I, I think, again, the French, mut the French army mutinies shows you that there's a limit to what men can stand and what an armed force can go through. So it's a, it's a timely warning about not pushing manpower too far. Um, but the British don't really have a mutiny. I mean, you get small scale mutinies, but nothing on anything on this, this scale, uh, which is remarkable, really, given how many other armies in the First World War go through very similar issues. You know, the the Italian army almost break in 1917, the Russian army break, German army break, the Austrians break, the Turks break, um, you know, the Romanians break. So the, most, most of the protagonists go through at one stage or another a, a major series of disciplinary problems, whereas, you know, we don't. So I think you're right, the, the question is really good. I think it's, it is important, but at the time, the British commanders aren't that clued into what's going on because the French keep it very, very tight in terms of who knows. Okay, thanks. Um, Andrew, you get an extra point for having a WFA calendar on your wall as well, by the way. Thank you, David. Malcolm, uh, unmute yourself. Thank you. Nick, um, very interesting talk. And you mentioned uh, the Americans and, and Pershing. Do you consider the entry of the Americans into the war contributed more to victory in psychological terms rather than in battle? Um, again, it's a difficult one to tell because you I mean how can you separate these things? I think the, I think it's both. I think the American entry is important because it gives France a lifeline. It gives them a sense of of, of the war continuing when they can win which is almost priceless in a way. Um, it also essentially provokes, or at least plays a heavy role in the German decision to strike on the Western Front in 1918. Um, I wouldn't underestimate or downplay the American, the military role that it plays, because if you think even in um, April 1918, when the Allies are you know, in, in dire straits, as it were, um, Pershing lets 10 American divisions go into the line now, 10 American divisions is like at least 20 Allied divisions because they're big divisions. Um, so this is a reinforcement of hundreds of thousands of men in many cases. It's like it frees up so many troops. And the Americans play crucial on Second Mar on the counterattack in 18th of July, which they couldn't have done without, uh, without the Americans. Um, so I think the American psychological impact is crucial, but it's when the Americans actually get on the ground and start fighting that the Germans realize they are definitely lost. So that they don't rate the Americans initially. They think they're a bunch of cowboys. They think they're useless. It's an incredible myopia of, of, of Germany. Just write this continent off. But the question is, are the Americans serious? And once the Americans are on the ground taking casualties and are, are showing that 
they might be pretty sort of green and not particularly you know not particularly effective the fact that they're willing to take the blood cost means that they are serious it means that they are there to stay and it means that germany has lost the war because and this goes into the armistice decisions because germany knows that yeah you know we need to accept these terms now because it doesn't get any better in 1919 so there's no point fighting because if the war carries on in 1919, the American army will destroy you and it will go into Germany. And, and that's not, you know, that's not up for debate. So I think, I, I hesitate to separate them. I think they're both important, but I think the American battlefield contribution um, and the severing of the Mezier railway line as well should not be underestimated. Thank you, Mick. Thanks, Malcolm. Got a question, interesting question from Kit Reed. Kit unfortunately doesn't have a microphone or a video, but Kit's asked the following question. Did French politicians like Lloyd George think the war could be won away from the Western Front? Um, it's not really the same debate in France as you get in Britain, um, where in Britain's always essentially one step removed from the Western Front, so we can always see it in a more detached way. No French politician really wants to move things away from the Western Front. They, you know, the, the French are in, the Germans are in Noyon, as, as Clemenceau's newspaper proclaimed every day. Um, so it has a real intimacy with the French. They understand that. You do get some politicians like uh, Briand. Um, he's more interested in something like the Balkans. They, they want the, the, the Salonika expedition to go ahead, and they, they're, they're keen on that, and they want resources to be sent there. Um, and there are various reasons for that. One of the reasons is to get a, a Republican general out of France to give him a job. Um, the other one is to try and rebuild a kind of French economic position in, in the Balkans and the Near East post-war. So there's a sort of economic interest there to try and build connections and, and to try and not colonize, but essentially put the French sort of stamp on that region. So they are thinking post-war. They don't have the same kind of um, Western as Easterners debate that we have in Britain, where they're there are some people who actually want to really limit the British contribution to the Western Front. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, David, David Livermore, you want to just unmute yourself there? Yeah, th thank you. And in a way, this relates to the, the previous question. You said something to the effect that in 1915, the British acted as if we didn't really want to be on the Western Front. Could you, could you just expand on that and say whether you think there was a real possibility that the great armies that were then being raised were actually going to be deployed in a different way to fight something more as a combined peripheral naval war as we'd fought in Napoleon's time or, or the Seven Years' War? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I think it's easy to see in hindsight that the ultimate destination of the new armies is France. This is not always, this is not always taken for given. I mean, you know, Kitchener is, is kind of playing around. And, uh, and I think that the problem is the British, they can't really fight the war they want to fight. There's a famous quote by Kitchener says, we're forced to make war as we must and not as we should like to. Um, they, they have to maintain the French. The problem is how many troops will maintain the French? How many troops will keep the French happy and will essentially keep them going? Well, as many as you can stay, you can spend. So ideally, Kitchener, they would have had, you know, an expeditionary force of a couple of corps really there that wouldn't do a lot. Might take part in the final advance, have a little bit of a cavalry. But the problem is you can't do that because, you know, the French need all the support they can get. So, but having said that, you know, you have Gallipoli and from 1915, you have that, that point, which is the main front? Is it France or is it Gallipoli? You know, the war cabinet has renamed the Dardanelles committee. So there is that moment where you realistically, could the British have abandoned the French on the Western front? No. And I think they know that, but, but they are, they're struggling with that and ultimately that dies after the Battle of Luz or, or maybe slightly before the Battle of Luz actually where the French um, they don't blackmail the British but the French politicians constantly stress French political weakness to the British whenever they talk to the French talk to the British they always say well you know between you and me uh, 
know, if, if this chap gets in power, he will negotiate with the Germans. We're very fragile. Public morale is very fragile. We're, we're watching where your divisions are going and we're watching very intently. So French politicians constantly play up how weak France is domestically. Actually, probably it's not that weak, but they play that up to bring more divisions in because their appetite can never be sated, as many as you can bring. Um, so I think there is that point in 1915 where they're kind of playing around with, and I think it depends on results. If they can break through a Gallipoli, if they make an assault and it can get near Constantinople, I think you would see much more pressure for resources to go that way rather than France. So ultimately they have no success anywhere. And then you have the rise of someone like William Robertson who says, everywhere else is pointless. It's only about France. And, and then they, they essentially go, OK, well, this is it. And from 1916 onwards, there isn't really any option. It's France. Great. Th thanks. Thanks for your question there, David. Um, next up is Sarah. Yeah, Sarah, do you want to mute yourself? Hi. Yeah, lovely talk. Thank you. Um, I'm interested. I like the way that you've talked about the, the Allies and also the Germans. And my question is, where, where did you get your information? What German records were you able to access? Were they not all destroyed in the Second World War or anything like that? Where, where did you find your source material for that, please? Well, I mean, there's, they're, they're not all destroyed. There are quite a lot of army records still available. You've got, you know, the Kriegs Archive in Munich, which I've been to, and there's various, there's uh, obviously Freiburg, which are the main, main records of, of sort of low level stuff. I think there's huge amounts of material that's available in the, there's like, I think, what's it, 15 volumes of official history, which again, most people don't look through. So they've got lots of documents within that as well. So you can kind of find the correspondence between many of these key individuals. Some of it's been lost. Um, but some of it was subsequently sort of published in the 20s. Um, and you get various, you know, obviously, um, you know, battlefield histories, unit records, personal memoirs, um, collections of papers. There's, there's actually a lot of um, collections of, um, of documents, diplomatic documents, strategic documents, all these kind of things. And so it, it's, there's even though lots of records have been destroyed or sort of primarily archival records that there's so much material you can get you can find that most people haven't looked at so it's the same with the French army really as well you know the the, the French official history that has these enormous annexes um, of, of documents which again most people don't go through but there's letters and letters and reports and letters and I don't even know how many pages the French official history is but it must be upwards of 10,000 pages it's, it's, you know, you've got enormous, enormous amounts of material. So it's, it's very sobering, really. So, yeah, there's still lots of stuff out there, I think, is, 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 a, is how I would respond to that. The question is what you, what you leave out. <laughs> Thank you. Very interesting. Th Thank thanks, you. Sarah. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, David. Enjoy most enjoyable that Nick. I really enjoyed it. The insight into the um, the various commander in chiefs of, of the various armies. My question is: um, It was said that Haig was a micromanager himself. Um, this being the case, did he over influence his subordinate commanders, and in doing so, extend the war? Well, I mean, I think there's a couple of questions in there. I think there's no doubt Haig does micromanage people at occasions. Um, micromanages Rawlinson on the Psalm, he micromanages people at Lewes, um, he can micromanage people at 30, the, the various occasions, and then there's other occasions where he, he, he takes the approach that, um, you know, you, you do it, you get on with it, I'll give you broad direction. So he's inconsistent, and I think that's what a number of the biographies have pointed out, there's no, it, it depends who's involved, so he micromanages sometimes when he shouldn't, and he leaves commanders alone when he should be more, provide more direction to them. So that's a somewhat frustrating aspect about Haig. Did, did Haig lengthen the war? I mean, I think it's, it's very difficult to say. I think he, he clearly makes a number of errors, um, mm. but ultimately he's, he's a solid and reliable character in 1918 and he, he's better in 1918 when he has less to do in a way, or at least has less to, less opportunity to do the micromanaging that you mentioned because he's got subordinates that can do it and he's dealing with the alliance picture, the strategic picture 
uh, the bigger picture and his commanders can fight the battles. And I think yes. when he's in that position, he's in a much more comfortable position and he works you know, fairly well. And there's not a lot of criticisms of him largely in 1918. He, he stands up to Foch when he needs to. He provides good advice to Foch when he needs to. Um, you know, so he, he, he does what he needs to do in 1918. I think, you know, we, could, we can talk about Haig's flaws and his earlier, the Somme or Passchendaele, that, things like that, I think, which have been well documented. But I think specifically, the micromanaging thing appears at times and then goes away at times. So it's, it's a sort of inconsistency, which can be quite frustrating with Haig. Yes, it, it seems to depend on what the British government are telling him to do, because they were managing him to and influencing him to be so subordinate to the French. And that's when he seems to pass the, pass the book to his commanders on, on the ground, like in Luce and places like that. Yeah. Okay. You know, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Most interesting. Thanks, Gordon, for your question. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Bill Twist doesn't have a microphone or a video, so I'm. Uh, if asked me to ask this on his behalf, Bill Twist's question is: Do you see the Italian Alpine campaign as a major feature, and where will it feature in Volume Two or Volume Three? Uh, volume Two. It's 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 all part of the sort of Austrian war, if you want the, the kind of Central European the Balkan War. Um, it will feature. It will be a part of that story in terms of the collapse of Austria and the the Balkan War. Um, how decisive it was, I think, remains to be seen. I'm not there yet. Um, I've had an open mind on it. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely going to be part of Volume Two, which which covers you know multiple different theatres in what I termed the, the sort of Eastern Front. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Uh, last question. I'm going to draw it to a close. We've still got other questions, but um, I, I do realise that we've had a, a very good session on the Q&A and I just don't want to overdo it. So, David, uh, your, your last up, your last question, um, fire away. Very much enjoyed the talk. Absolutely marvellous. Um, as somebody who's looking forward to the further two um, books, um, it might sort of answer the question for me that I've got anyway. Um, but uh, as I've lost it, I've, I've lost me, me train a bit. The, the thing is, will we ever understand what happened in the First World War, given the immense size, the number of people, the changes that were made and everything else? Uh, for instance, um, there, it, in the last 100 years of uh, people writing about the uh, First World War, we've had people who have been heroes, then demoted to villains, and have now been re-educated re and are now back to being heroes. Um, so what I'm trying to ask is, can we ever understand, or is it something that will always be a quest for historians? Yeah, no, I think that's a good one to end on, I suppose. I think history is an endless story, so the other interpretations will come, fashions will change, and, and how we look at it will maybe change over time. But I suspect that um, we are in a better position now than we have been to, to make these judgments. Uh, we have a lot more access to the records. We've sort of, we have seen what comes next. So you could begin to start to gauge these things in a wider context, which is what I'm trying to do. But this is just my, my perspective on it, how I see it. And undoubtedly other people will emphasize certain other things or may have a different view on certain commanders. So I think you can never have the final view, but I think you can have views which stand up for a long time, which is what I've tried to do. So we will see. Thank you. Super. I'm, I'm sorry to ask such a question. No, it's a good one to end on. I, I, I identified that one as a, as a good ending question. So, 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 so thanks for that, David. Um, Nick, um, as we can tell from the uh, sheer volume and the depth of the questions, that's been a very engaging uh, talk, which has been thoroughly enjoyed by several hundred people plus uh, uh, another hundred or so on Facebook. So it's, it's certainly uh, been of great interest to our members so uh, everybody would, who uh, if you'd care to raise your hands please as a final round of applause uh, to, to Nick I know you can't see the hands going up and it's uh, all very virtual and everything but please take this as a as a final round of applause uh, to you Nick um, 
we, I'm, I'm certain that uh, the, the, the book will sell well, and I, I hope that the next two volumes uh, sell as well as, as, as volume number one. So uh, thanks very much indeed for, for your time this evening. It's been thoroughly enjoyable. And um, from everybody on the Western Front Association, thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much. Good night, everybody. Good, good night. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Mademoiselle from Armitage.